Right, tēnā koutou. Everybody, my name is Jolie Wills from New Zealand Red Cross. I lead the psychosocial recovery. Um, I would like to introduce my co-presenter, Dr Lucy Daith from um, Canterbury District Health Board. Lucy is involved in some um, really interesting and exciting projects. I'll let her introduce herself and those in a moment. Um, after the, today's presentation, we um, have a couple of colleagues that we'll all be, if you have any questions, we'll all make ourselves available afterwards so that you can come up and see us. We have um, Adele Wilkinson from the Mental Health Education and Resource Centre and Holly Griffin from New Zealand Red Cross. So we'll make ourselves available afterwards. Um, I'll let Lucy get us started. Kia ora koutou. So this session is about... Um, we're coming into the third winter since uh, the earthquakes and it's a long, hard road. I don't need to tell you these things. And so this session is about how we look after ourselves during this process. So I'm aware that all of you will have a long list of things that you've probably brought with you today around insurance and insulation and uh, keeping the house warm and, and rebuilding. And this session is about reminding people to keep yourself and the people you love on that list because recovery is about people so we need to be making sure that people are at the center of recovery and um, uh, I work for this district health board and and with uh, colleagues from the mental health foundation we've been working on the all right campaign I'm hoping that you've seen it on bus stops or buses or in the papers um, this is a, a campaign which is to remind us to to look after ourselves in very simple ways because uh, we can uh, nurture our own well-being and that's what's going to get us through, but we need to work on it. So this is a, a, a graph which outlines a typical disaster. Of course, there's no such thing as a typical disaster and when it's happening to us, it's really a horrific experience We're, and we've all gone through that. But, and so all disasters are slightly different, but all disasters pretty much follow this pattern. So immediately it hits, human beings are incredible. They feel an outpouring of, uh, of concern for each other. And so you will recall when there were students on the streets, there was the farmy army around, uh, we did a lot of shoveling. We did a lot of trying to look after each other. Uh, neighbours really looked out for neighbours. Family really looked out for family. And that was actually, although it was a horrible, scary phase for many of us, we also kind of remember it reasonably fondly because it was a pretty special time for some of us. We really knew who our friends were and we knew we could rely on each other. And then we, we go through a sense that okay, this has happened and we're going to have to uh, get on with it now. And particularly in New Zealand, where we, uh, where we see ourselves as, as resourceful people who can deal with stuff, we're a pioneer people. Um, I don't know if any of you came to the Share an Idea um, sessions that were here. It seems a long time ago now. There was a, a kind of phase where we thought, okay, we're going to build the best city in the world and, and we're going to get on with it. And then there's a whole series of feelings that come next as we realise quite what an enormous task it is we're facing. So, um, and some of the feelings that you guys told us, because we did a lot of research before we did the All Right campaign, and these feelings of being over it, stoked, feeling lucky, feeling on edge or overwhelmed, these are the feelings that hit us as we realise just exactly what we've got to do to get back to our own recovery and to get back as a, a population, a city-wide recovery. And of course, everyone's journey on this recovery road is slightly different because we're all slightly different and we're all facing slightly different things. So the All Right postering uh, said underneath it in the first posters, Canterbury's been through a lot and we all see things a little differently and that's all right because we'll all make a slightly different journey through and because our, our disaster is unique, we went through uh, September and then February. And then when we thought we were hitting the honeymoon period, we hit June. And then we had snow, which was a slightly different bit of disaster. And then we, t we had two Christmases in a row where we had significant aftershocks. So our pattern is our own pattern. And we'll be making our individual way through it. 
and it's really hard work. And I was just saying to Jolie how spectacularly tired I feel this weekend, and I expect many of you will be feeling a feeling of weariness, and that's pretty normal for what we've been through. And so this session is about talking about that experience and how we can manage it, because although it's really hard work, we are really resourceful as humans and we can manage it. We just need to make a priority of it, just like we make priorities of other, other parts. So we reckon that most of the city are somewhere within this circle. Some people are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel and that can be the most tiring phase. And some people really are, are in, the, in the thick of it still. And so one of our messages today is that we know that because we're social animals, this city will recover when we are all uh, through the process and we need to stick together through the process. And events like this are about reminding all of us that until everyone's got a, uh, a working toilet or everyone's got, got their house repaired, only then will we be able to talk about full recovery. So reminding us that we're not alone and, and we've got lots of people looking out for us. There's a few things that I find incredibly reassuring about this graph. Um, we know that, as, we, as Lucy said, every disaster is different. We might be at quite different places on this graph. Um, but there are a few things that I find really reassuring. One is to know that what we're going through and what we're experiencing is normal. I think that's quite, it reduces some of my anxiety, for sure. Um, another is that if you look at the end point on that graph, it's above the beginning point. So while we're in the thick of it, it's very hard to see. People who have come out the other end from disasters around the world often say that they're in a much better place than what they were originally. It's a long, hard road to get there, but they say that they learned a lot about themselves um, and what they value and what really sustains them and nourishes them and what their priorities are during that process. So it may not feel like it while we're in the thick of it, but um, it's certainly it's, it's quite a long path to get there, but it's very re encouraging when you look at that end point. I'm just going to show a video now. This is a video um, of a family in Shrews Shrewsbury, I never say it, in the UK. They experienced, along with all their neighbours, a flood um, and they were all living in caravans outside their houses, so the whole neighbourhood in a caravan outside each house. And it really is a nice illustration of this graph. You know, it talks about, um, you have to listen quite carefully to some of the um, narrative in there, but it talks very much about a party atmosphere, about joining the caravan club, how it was, you know, a great deal of fun initially, and then the reality sits in. So, you know, we've seen it from our own perspective, and sometimes it's really nice just to see it from the perspective of, you know, a different disaster somewhere else. I'm Julie Irwin. I live in Tewkesbury, which is a beautiful historic market town where two rivers meet in the centre of town. And I've lived here for 19 years now, safely in my own home, until unfortunately the devastation of July the 20th, I was forced to move out here on the front of the house in a caravan with my husband, my three children, my dog and my two cats. I'm John and this is 99 Canterbury Lees. I'm Laddie, I'm six. I'm Maddie and I'm ten. I'm Connor and I'm 13. And I'm Julie and I'm not going to say my age. Tell me up please, love. It's an experience I'll never forget, really, July the 20th. I just waited and waited and watched and watched waters rising and rising. And um, I decided to go off and try and get, to s get some sleep because um, it was early hours in the morning by this time. And as you can imagine, it wasn't, you just didn't go to sleep. You were just up looking out the window, watching the waters, feeling quite sick. Initially, when we first saw this caravan, we were quite excited because we needed a sixth berth because of having five of us. Yeah, I mean, as the caravans were being delivered into the street, kind of ended up as a bit of a kind of party atmosphere mm. um, because it was still the summer so of an evening instead of people being sat inside their houses they were sat outside on tables and chairs outside the caravans and it kind of for, for about a month it was it was quite good fun we all joined the caravan club <laughs> and then as i say reality takes hold you know the weather started getting bad and it's getting darker and you are in here apart from sleeping and the reality is somewhat different it's not exciting anymore and um it's confined and it's cramp and, you know, it's quite stressful with three children because there is nowhere to go. It's really squashy and you always have to climb over the table. Me and my brothers always start to fight and my sister because we come, we're 
always together and Watson is really stuffed in here. Yeah, she just missed her own space, really. I think more than anything. So we may be able to relate to much of that. But what I find really interesting in there that is without personal space, without you know privacy, and without those little routines in our lives that we take for granted, that you know those things are really important to our relationships and to our well-being. But sometimes we don't realise it because they are so um, ingrained in our normal life. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. You want to talk about that, Lucy? I was talking to someone about the session we did yesterday and they said, oh, I didn't really want to sit in on that session because it's all a bit fluffy, isn't it? Um, it's, it's not fluffy, it's science. Um, so many of you will have this sheet on your chair. This is um, the five ways to well-being and this is hard science. It's in bright colours and it's pretty easy to read, but take this as a scientific paper. Um, it's based on the... Um, it's based on the New Economics Foundation's work for the Foresight Project in the UK. And what they did was they read basically every single academic article that had been written across the world about what promotes mental well-being and mental health for humans. And they came up, having read all this material, with these five ways to well-being. Connect, take notice, learn, give, and be active. Because again and again, these human actions that we do every day anyway. Have you already made a cup of tea for someone? Well, that's giving. If you spoke to them when you gave it to them, that's connecting. You're doing it every day, but it does make a difference. And so what we are saying through the All Right campaign is remember not to neglect these little things. Because these little things are what keep us well. If you think in terms of your cell phone, and God knows after the earthquakes, I learned the importance of always having my cell phone charged so I could find out where the kids were. Um, these are the things that charge our, 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 um, our cell phones. These are the things that keep our metaphorical petrol tanks full. Um, so if you are neglecting these little things, then you are then you're going to be in worse trouble than if you take care of them. So um, the, five, the five ways are deeply embedded in the posters that you see behind you, um, reminding people to take notice of the beautiful moon we had last night, to remember that showing a bit of love, which might be doing a bit of baking or hanging out with your kids at the park or your grandkids, these little things are actually scientifically proven to help to boost our, our batteries, and that's really important. And if you think that's too much science, bad news, because you're going to get a bit more now from Jolie about what's going on in our bodies and why we're feeling so tired. All right, that's a good prelude to um, this next session, which is about cortisol. So cortisol is a stress hormone, and you're probably more familiar with adrenaline. You know, so when there's an, a stressful event, um, adrenaline pumps our body. So if you think about it, it's akin to um, if we encounter a wild animal. So in the adrenaline phase, it's an all or nothing type, um, a type scenario where you have to mobilise absolutely everything in your body, get it all pumping, and the hope if you put it all out there, then you'll be able to tell the tale tomorrow. So it's about mobilising all your resources all at once. And that's for immediate threat. So cortisol is quite different. Cortisol is for a completely different scenario. Cortisol is, um, as adrenaline is for a, um, looking at a wild animal right now, cortisol is the uh, stress hormone which comes about when uh, we're faced with a famine. So it's quite a different survival type mechanism. So a famine is long, ongoing, indeterminate in length, you don't know when the end is, and there's certainly nothing you can do about it right now to change you know, how you're going to be feeling tomorrow or what the outcome might be. So your body, if it were to mobilise everything all at once, um, it, you probably wouldn't have a good outcome for a famine. So your body does quite the reverse. Your body shuts everything down as much as it possibly can. The non-essential, non-survival um, elements get closed down. So it's about conserving so that we can last the, difference, uh, the, last the distance. So it is quite different. 
and that long ongoing stress that we have in front of us, does that sound familiar? So I know initially there was a lot of adrenaline and still when we get aftershocks, thankfully much fewer, but this adrenaline still occurs. But cortisol is much more about the ongoing, there's very little we can do today or tomorrow about fixing our houses so that we can have it all sorted. It is going to be a long ongoing process. Now the effects of adrenaline, uh, sorry, of cortisol, sorry, I just found my page. So if I go back to a little bit about the body shutting everything down, if it's not essential for today and for surviving today and getting through, then our body and our mind really don't want to do it. So you think about the, some of the things that we used to have energy for or some of the things that we really would like to do, but we just feel so tired. You know, there's, a, there's a chemical reason for that. Um, you know, and sometimes we, I know, you know for myself, we tend to judge ourselves in terms of our coping ability because we just don't have the energy that we should. You know, this, this is very much the impact of cortisol. This is not a choice thing. It's really our body um, 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 connecting with cortisol and, and doing as it's told, given that we have this long threat in front of us. So it feels very much like we are wading through mud. Okay, everything that we used to do, it just feels so much harder. So it's like wading through mud. And we say it's like wading through mud with blinkers on. Because in the honeymoon phase, if you remember that graph, you know, we were, we were very connected with each other. In the cortisol phase, we have this list of things that we've got to get through, we've got to endure, and we've got to keep putting one foot in front of the other. And we become much more blinkered. We become very focused on that. We've, we have a very you know, limited amount of energy and focus, and it goes in one place. And when people come to you, you really hope that they're coming with a solution to your problem to ease you, the way with your long list of things, because anything else is just, you know, you're just adding to my list, go away. You know, so we are much less tolerant during this phase, much more cranky and very tired. So it's quite a different phase to that initial, you know, and it helps explain some of what we're feeling during that, that graph that we saw before. Okay, and a couple of the effects of um, cortisol is that firstly, you know, it doesn't do us any good to really focus during a famine on how hungry we are. We just keep putting one foot in front of the other. So cortisol shuts off our feedback loop. So often we don't know how tired we are. You know, everything feels harder but we often don't, um, we don't realise how empty our tank is, we just focus on, keep, on keeping going. So we don't um, acknowledge sometimes that we really need to do more to replenish that tank. The second thing is that um, one of the things that gets shut down is our ability to think strategically and think creatively. And if you think about some of the challenges and the things that we're looking ahead of thinking about replanning for our future and rebuilding, you think um, being able to think creatively and strategically and plan and think ahead would be you know, a useful thing to be able to do. Um, so we actually have almost the reverse thing going on. So if you, we hear about quake brain. Have you heard that expression, earthquake brain? Yeah. In um, Australia, they have um, bushfire brain. So it's the same thing, this is cortisol, and you may find that it's quite hard to remember things, it's quite hard to absorb new information. Um, that's very much the impact of the, the long-term stress hormones. So that's quite normal. So all of this is not about making you feel quite fearful or down, it's about acknowledging what we're experiencing and knowing that it feels normal, uh, knowing that it is normal, which can reduce your anxiety. Some of the dangers really about um, you know, having this ongoing cortisol where we just keep going one foot in front of the other, focusing with our blinkers on and not stepping out to do those wonderful things that Lucy said, you know, we'll recharge our batteries. If we just stay in that, that focused state without taking a break from it, um, there are some real, real dangers. Firstly, um, we, we risk um, impacting our health in a negative way. So there's no free lunch in our bodies. You know, if we are just going and going and going and not listening and not connected with our body saying, hang on a minute, you haven't recharged me lately, then there will be a health consequence. Um, secondly, you know, relationships, they take nurturing. You know, for a short period of time, you can put relationships on the back burner, you know, and focus on, on other things, you know. We're pretty tolerant, especially during that early phase. But relationships do take nurturing, they take feeding into, they take looking after. And you can't neglect them for an extended period of time, you know, the time that we're looking at for recovery without there being an impact. And we've talked about planning and decision making. You know, if we are not being able to use our strategic part of our brain, then we may be making decisions for our future or just rushing through and getting things done without really investing in, in what our future might look like. 
And lastly, you know, degraded quality of life. We're going to hear a little bit from Dr. Rob Gordon. Dr. Rob Gordon is a psychologist. He's from Australia and has supported families and um, individuals and communities through more than 30 disasters. And he talks about people coming out the other end of, of recovery and they've just been so focused, like this with their blinkers on, and they come out the other end and actually realise, well, actually all the things that I used to enjoy doing, I haven't done and I, I haven't looked after my health, I haven't looked after my relationships. I might have ended up with a rebuilt house, um, but you know I haven't looked after my relationships and the things that are important to me, my career and all the other things along the way. So these are the dangers of being in cortisol mode. So this is the reality of, of what we're facing and I guess um, you know the really good news is that we don't have to be in this all the time. We have to make concerted effort, even for a short period of time, to step out of it, to take a break, to recharge our batteries so that we last the distance. And Lucy's going to talk a little bit about that. So... Oh. I did some work in... Uh... I wasn't supposed to do that, sorry. Um, Sorry, that's my fault. This is Dr. Rob Gordon that we talked about earlier. Um, Dr. Rob Gordon has told a wonderful um, example of cortisol brain, so of quake brain, we would call it. So the inability to be able to think creatively or strategically. This is an example he talks about of a farmer after the Rangitiki floods. And um, you may think to some of your decision making, I sort of think to some of mine, and see sometimes I look back and think, oh yes, cortisol was definitely in, in, um, in power for me right then. But here's, here's an example some work in uh, Palmerston North after the Manawatu floods and I remember a farmer describing his neighbour coming to him. The neighbour's bridges had been washed out, his, uh, a lot of his stock had been lost but he, had, he still had some stock and after some months he came to his neighbour and said uh, he wanted to borrow his gun and shoot all the, all the remaining stock and his neighbour uh, had been worried about whether this man was suicidal so he said, you know, why do you want my gun? I want to shoot all my stock. Why do you want to shoot your stock? Because they survived the flood, but I just can't bear to watch them starve and die in the paddocks. It's not fair. I'm going to shoot them all. Why? Because I can't get them off. The bloody council won't rebuild the bridges, and they're stuck there, and uh, I'm just going to have to shoot them. And uh, he said, well, hang on a second. Why don't we cut the fence? take them through my paddocks over my bridges and use my yards to load them on the trucks and take them to the adjustment paddocks that the Farmers Federation have organised for us in the next valley. Uh, you know, so it, you see, when you're in that cortisol state, you're operating within the current familiar programs of your thinking. You can't innovate. This is a very extreme example, but a fence is not something you cut to remove stock. It's something that defines where the stock can go and where they can't. He hasn't questioned that assumption. He's thought they're stuck, can't get them out through the gate, have to shoot them. So, uh, if, rec if recovery is happening across the world, and we see a lot of disaster on our TV, and we know that human beings are amazing, that we do uh, come back from things. And, uh, and so these are the principles that will get us through. And uh, we're allowed to use this, um, this photo from the Australian Red Cross um, with the proviso that we advise very strongly, God forbid we get floods, but if we do, please do not sit in the flood because it's not, we don't want you to think that that's what the um, Australian Red Cross is promoting. What they are promoting is that we need to take time out to enjoy uh, meaningful activities. And when we did the research for um, behind this campaign, we asked people, so what is it? What is it that, that makes you feel well? And people talked about connecting with their family and friends. People really enjoy each other's company, the company of people they love. So this is a session, you'll have heard lots of technical advice as you've gone around and asked your questions. This is a session to remind us that actually going on a mate date or, or, or ha really catching up with your girlfriends is a priority. It's what will, uh, it's what will make us well and get us through this. Um, and, and so if you leave asking yourself one question from this, uh, the question should be, what have I done or what am I going to do this weekend for me? 
You know, it might be a, 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 a watching a movie or it might be walking to the park or it might be checking out the moon again tonight. But what are you going to do for you? Because you are the most important bit of your recovery. And then the second most important bit are the people you love most. So carrying them on that journey is really important. And the third recovery principle um, is knowing that we all do deal with this differently. We will be at different stages. That first graph, there should be some circles on it because we'll kind of loop back into bits which, which are really terrible and we may loop back into bits where we just feel really proud of how we've coped is one of the things that people talked about to us in the research. So knowing that a wide range of reactions is normal and giving people space to, when you ask them, are you all right? giving them space to tell you how they really are. Because all right is a conversation and we need to be looking out for each other's well-being and accepting where people are. And if they're really not all right, or you're leaving this session thinking, geez, I'm really not all right, knowing that there are people available to help, especially in terms of talking to people and that you will have a, an all right card with some of Rob Gordon's tips on, on, your, um, on your desk. If you don't like the picture you got, come up and change it for the one you do like. But there is a, an 0800 number on here and you still can access uh, support to talk things through. Because I know Cantabrians are pretty stoic, but we've been through a lot and it's all right to ask for help. And these are the, the, the typical normal human reactions. You next. <coughs> So as Lucy said, this is the all right material that talks about what we're feeling is normal and the importance of social connection and meaningful activities. I'm going to show you next a video that again looks at disasters. These ones are in Australia, three different disasters, um, looking at the, the recovery principles we talked about, the importance of social connection, talking to others and realising that what we're going through other people are as well and that we're, we are quite normal, um, and meaningful activities. Oh, I'm being, yeah, opportunity to talk. <coughs> you can respond in so many different ways. You can get angry or um, you can just become really quiet even though you want to scream at something. We all wanted to talk about it. We all wanted to tell our own story and you wanted to share what you were feeling at that moment. But it's not just about talking, it's about having your story heard. And that's what people really want to, want to know. They want to know that someone's listening and someone's caring about what they're saying. And unless you get out into meetings like this and speak to people, you don't realise that you're not alone. Um, I spoke to my husband a few months ago and said, you know, I see this brown water coming through the backyard all the time. And he said, oh, yeah, I'm moving furniture all night in his sleep. And then there was another man up the road that said he's trying to move the pool table in his sleep. But unless you're out there speaking to people and, and admit that you're having these dreams or thoughts, you think that it's just you and that, that you're going crazy, but you're not. It's critical to knowing who, who is your community now? Or what do I do next? Um, what are you doing next? Well, knowing what you're doing next will help me figure out w what I might do next. Connection for the community is vital because you don't want to be alone. Not that you don't want to be alone, but you can't be. It's to the what has, has happened in, in any tragedy is tremendous. It's too huge for you to comprehend. <coughs> okay, and Dr. Rob Gordon talks a lot about cortisol and adrenaline, and he talks a lot about the importance of social connection and all those recovery principles. But he talks very much about the tonic, if one thing that he can put across, the tonic really for um, cortisol is pleasure and leisure. So pleasure is about doing what you enjoy, doing what you find meaningful. Um, it may be social connection, it may be um, carpentry, it may be, you know, whatever you find meaningful and enjoyable for you. 
Leisure is the time where you don't have anything on your list or you put your list aside and, and ask yourself, give yourself the space, ask yourself, what do I want to do? What do I need to do? So it's really about giving yourself that space. He says to ask yourself, what am I not doing that I used to enjoy? You know, what have I, when I've gone into cortisol mode, everything else seemed superfluous, right? All those other things just seemed fluffy and unimportant because I've got this list to get through. And actually, those things are really crucial to our recovery. So he's saying, what did you used to do that you, you know, are not continuing anymore? How can you bring that back into your life, even in a different way if the pool that you used to go to is no longer there? Or how can you maintain, you know, your quality of life during the period of recovery. So it is long, we know that. So how can you, rather than put your life aside until everything's completed, how can you live and enjoy your life in the meantime? So those are the questions he says, you know, really important to ask. And pleasure and leisure, we see it as the tonic to cortisol because even if you are able to lift your eyes for a short period of time and remove your blinkers and recharge your batteries, then, you know, we're going to be so much better off for it. Okay. So pleasure and leisure, it is about, you know, it's the, the anecdote, or antidote, rather, to um, cortisol. It's about keeping our tank full, recharging our batteries. It's about re-engaging our feedback loop and taking the time to think, am I really depleted? Or how am I really feeling? It's about protecting those things in life that give our life value. And it's about um, giving ourselves the space and the ability to be able to think creatively and strategically as we need to, to think about our recovery. And thinking about recovery in terms of, it's, it's, this is the f our future of our life. It's not just about putting back what we used to have. And Rob will talk a little bit about that in a moment. So we have now um, six tips from Dr. Rob Gordon. So these are, um, he has supported, as I said, you know, many people through th more than 30 different disasters. And he sees things again and again. And he said, if there are six simple strategies that um, would be really helpful to keep in mind as we're going through it, these would be um, them. So we'll see six, six quick video tips. After a disaster, and even as time goes by in the recovery period, there's a very strong focus coming from everywhere else about replacing what we've lost. And that is very easy to push people to feel they must do it quickly. The problem is, we can't. It's so complex. Usually a disaster is such a profound experience, it changes everything. It changes the meaning of life and the goals we can anticipate for the future. So the real basis for recovery is to form the foundation for a new stage of life. We can't do that unless we've got time to think, unless we've got the energy to plan, unless we've got the space in our mind and our lives to turn things over and look at various options. So it's most important to take time and realise that you'll only do this once. I once met an elderly couple who had rebuilt their house. It took them about two years. But when they settled into their house, they were very disappointed. They could see all sorts of things that they could have done differently, could have done better. They didn't really enjoy living in their house. But they said, we don't have any more money. We're too old. This is the only house we'll ever have. So every day is a reminder of what they missed. In the end, they said, I think we did it too fast. We didn't take enough time. It's most important, if we're going to take recovery as the foundation for the next stage of our lives, that we give ourselves the time and space to think ahead and plan and make the best decisions. The essential nature of stress is to focus us on the problems causing the stress in the real world outside of us. And in order to do that, we stop listening to ourselves. We stop listening to our bodies, our minds, our emotional needs, our social needs. And we can steadily lose energy without realising it until all of a sudden we get to the end of the rope and we fall over and we're deeply exhausted. When that happens, we often don't have the physical energy to manage our emotions. And that's when they start to go haywire. We have to realise that in a state of stress, we can keep going until we fall over because we don't notice how tired we're getting. When we're stressed, we shut down the communication channel with our own bodies. But 
we won't get through without losing the energy and maybe having a crisis. If we get too run down, that's when we can't think clearly. We can't see things in perspective. We start to feel despondent. We can go on and get depressed. So what we need to do is keep looking at ourselves, listening to our bodies, feeling how we are, and constantly trying to break out of the stress mold and give ourselves brief moments of relaxation and recharging. There are lots of simple things that recharge us. A bit of humour, a bit of downtime, a walk, just taking time out for a moment and most importantly, enjoying ourselves. If we can't charge our phones up in one full sitting overnight, at least we can charge them for a few minutes every now and again. And it's the same with our minds, our bodies, our emotions and our social life. Constantly recharging gives us the energy to last the distance of a long and complex recovery period. <coughs> there are many things in recovering from a disaster that are outside of our control. For a start, what happens in the disaster? And then the money that's available for it, uh, for the recovery process. The approvals and decisions that we depend on for recovery. And most of all, the pace at which things progress. But when we're stressed, the nature of stress is to keep us focusing on the most intense problems. And these inevitably are going to be the things that we can't control because they are the things that we worry about. But no matter how many of those there are, there are always other things we can do and can control. We can make other decisions. We can decide, for example, to accept the pace that's imposed upon us rather than to fight it. And our natural tendency is to go back all the time to the problems we can't solve. So we need to make a decision to retrack our attention onto what we can do. And then we regain the sense of having some control and some ability to manage our own circumstances. The effect of stress is determined by, on the one hand, the nature of the problems causing the stress. And they are going to be the things we feel worst about, the things we can't control. But the stress is also caused by the attitudes we have and the way we view it, and that we do have some control over. Constantly refocusing on what we can do, what we have achieved, what we will do next, gives us the sense that no matter how long it takes, we will get through it and there will be an end in sight. One of the most important things that happens during the recovery period is that our lives are disrupted in every area. The stress demands our constant focus on problems. But what we don't realise is that we have to drop out all of those things that don't apparently add to our dealing with the problems. But the things we drop out will be the things that we used to do that added value to our lives. The time spent alone the time to reflect, the time spent with friends sharing experiences, the time doing things that gave us enjoyment. I met a woman who used to go swimming several times a week. That was her main form of exercise. And she had a social network. And when the pool was destroyed, it took her two years to find another form of recreational exercise. Eventually, she d decided to join a walking group but it would have been so much better if she could have actually done that much earlier. We must remember that we can't put aside the quality of our life and the things that give us energy, joy and meaning until the end of the recovery period. It's too long, we lose too much. We don't realise how important it is that we try to form regular routines wherever we can in our daily life. They free us up 
so that we can think about things while we're doing our routines. They give us security, familiarity, and a sense of safety. So the, the risk is that without constant preoccupation with all the multiple problems, we drop out of our routines and we're constantly improvising from one minute to the next. This is emotionally and physically exhausting. But most importantly, it gives us no time, no time to reflect and think. If a couple find that after dinner, they have a cup of tea while the kids watch television and use that time to be together and think about the problems of the family and how to manage it. All we need to do is put them in temporary accommodation maybe staying with relatives where they're living in one room and that's gone. But they'll be improvising so much they mightn't realise it. It's going to be very important to hold that time but they'll have to do it differently. Maybe they can do it after the kids go to bed or arrange it in some other way. Try to think about what we can hang on to or how we can give time and attention to forming a routine way of life for the recovery period that hangs on to some of the important things we expressed in those routines. They might include exercise, time together, time doing enjoyable activities, but even just the regular routines of meals, of uh, talking together, of taking stock of things, of scheduling private time. All of these things are essential for us to maintain the quality of life that get, gets us through the recovery period. <laughs> there are so many things during the recovery period that cause us hassles and problems. And we tend to push them to a side while we focus on the big things. But it's the big things we often find hard to control. And the problem is the little things will develop because they're signs of something not going right. Sleeplessness, digestive problems, headaches, stress reactions in our bodies. These things are signs that our bodies are not really able to manage the stress we've got. And if we don't deal with them, they're going to slowly undermine our energy levels and our ability to deal with things. In relationships, it's very important not to let misunderstandings, hurt feelings and disappointments just drift past because they will accumulate and that will create tension and conflict. The most important thing is to have the feeling of support from our family and friends. But we need to make a decision not to let things go by because we've got bigger things on our minds. We can't change the bigger things quickly, but the small things we can change and prevent them developing into bigger things that will eventually undermine our ability to do things as we want them. So what we're experiencing is a really typical disaster. And we've heard from people in England and in Australia who've probably felt many of the feelings that we're feeling at the moment. And we're typical human beings, so our bodies react in pretty standard ways. There's the adrenaline and then there's the cortisol. And when we know that, we've got a chance to manage it. And we're not typical because we're really very special. And the people who we love and the people who are precious to us are unique. We're in unique little constellations of, of, of human life. So caring for each other during this period and caring for ourselves, we're the ones in charge of that, not EQC, not anyone else. The little things we can do for each other and for the people we love and for ourselves are things that we can do right now. So as we close up this session, I want to let you know that if you want to see the full um, Rob Gordon vi video, DVD, we can send you a copy. There's a, a, a sign-up sheet at the back. Um, please give us your details where you want it sent to and we'll send it to you. There's no cost for that. Please collect some, uh, some, some of our material and, and, um, and flick it around the places you go to the people who might want to hear it. And um, if you or someone you love 
you think is really not all right, please do access some services because there are people who are around to help and the 0800 number on the back of these postcards is a really good place to start. And I want you to leave here promising yourself something for you, something little, something that really does make you feel all right because it is the simple things that will give us joy and that's not just a, a, an add-on, a nice to have, that's something that we absolutely need to prioritise every day for the next few, few years probably and then we'll get into a habit and uh, then the level of all rightness across the whole city will, uh, will rise and we will, like the graph says, come out of this stronger um, thank you very much for being here. Please do come and talk to us if you'd like to. And uh, we wish you very well with your recovery journey.